So um, I'm really glad to be here like everybody else. The title of my project is Promoting Soil Health and Carbon Sequestration in Chilean Agricultural Systems. And I'm going to be working with two different universities, um, with Claudia Rojas at the Universidad de O'Higgins, and then here at the Universidad de Chile with actually like a bunch of different people. But um, Osvaldo Sal Salazar is one of my primary contacts here. So a little about me, I'm an associate professor of agroecology at the University of Maryland. I have a lot of connections to some of you in this room. I went to undergrad in Ohio, I went to UVA. <laughs> uh, I think there's another University of Maryland grad over here. So, um, And uh, I came to all of this, I was, I was an English major, I studied poetry and Spanish, and now here I am. So you can make lots of swerves in your life. <laughs> and and um, uh, just other little fun facts, uh, I run a community garden, I have a nonprofit in Washington DC called Farm the District, and um, I'm the, I started as a community coordinator, and then I built a nonprofit. It's actually how I met my husband <laughs> on the farm. And, uh, and we tried to turn urban green spaces, both permanent and then ephemeral spaces, into uh, places where you can grow food. So right now we're, well, I'm not obviously there right now, but my team is helping grow all of the, the greenhouse plants. Um, but we have a location that's a temporary space. It will be turned into condo buildings next year but we have been able to grow over 2,000 pounds of food each year, and we distribute that to different um, to the volunteers, but also to different food banks in the city. And I just like to, um, so those of you who are really interested in like urban ag and agroecology, um, I'm interested in getting myself involved in some of that here in Santiago as well. Okay, what I study <laughs> is climate change. <laughs> and how our agricultural systems can and need to be designed both to adapt to climate change, but also how they can mitigate and, and actually prevent climate change. And so the way that I do that is by thinking about agroecosystem services. And I'm gonna talk about what that is in a minute, although all of you are very well educated, so some of this might be a little bit of a refresher. And I spent a lot of time recently focusing on coastal ag. Obviously Chile has a pretty big coast. And so there's a lot of different kinds of ecosystems along the coast, and our coastlines are some of the first systems that are being really impacted by climate change in a way that's super visible, right? So we can talk about how, you know, maybe our corn crops are not yielding as much, or maybe the wheat crops are failing in certain areas, but it's really hard to deny when your crop is underwater. <laughs> It's a very visible, very tangible sign of climate change that's happening now. It's not happening in the future, it's happening right now all across the planet. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the work that I'll be doing um, here in Chile to focus on that. This is uh, one of my field sites in, um, in Maryland. And so the first question I thought I would just, you know, like, what? does she study, is agroecology. So what is that? <laughs> so um, after I've listened to a lot of your presentations, probably all of you have taken ecology or biology at some point. And so what I, what I do as an agroecologist is very simple. We apply some of those basic principles that we learned in biology, that we learned in ecology. What's an organism? What's an individual? What's a population? What's a community? How does energy move? How do nutrients move? And we use that framework to look at Agriculture, not rocket science, but <laughs> our industrial food systems are designed to produce food. They do one thing. We do it arguably well, but that's it. They don't, we don't think about them as a way of doing other things. Like agricultural systems, they exist in the environment. They can do other things. If you look at this picture, you'll notice roads, house, right? There's some creeks, ditches, trees. There's a forest there. So everything we do is in this agroecosystem matrix. And so what I do in my work is I try to think about agricultural systems as providing some of these other um, functions or agroecosystem services. And specifically, just some examples would be purifying our water. This uh, flower strip that Ellen's gonna be thinking about, if you planted that on the edge of the field, it could prevent pesticides, fertilizer, even sediment from running off into a nearby creek. That's a pretty good thing. That's a nice ecosystem service. But you have to design it, right? You have to provide incentives to farmers to do something like that. Another one is flood protection. I work on the coast. If you leave a little bit of native marsh, 
between your farm and the actual you know, water body, that can provide flood protection, not just for your farm, but like way, way up line, like to your house or to your neighbor's house. And so again, it has to be intentional. You have to design the system so that you're like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give up not a lot, but maybe just like from here, you know, to the wall as a strip of marsh. I'm gonna leave it there on purpose. I'm not gonna grow corn or soy or wheat, but that's gonna provide all these other services to my farm and also to my community. This is what I spend all my time thinking about is carbon. <laughs> so I do, I do a lot with water purification, um, but mainly I think about carbon. And carbon as being sort of the currency of how we think about, how I think about climate change. And so, oh, oh that's fun. Oh, okay, it might not do it pretty. Oh, it's gonna do it pretty, okay. Okay, so um, when we think about uh, soil carbon, or uh, one of the main things that we, we think about now is, is soil health. And so soil health um, is linked to a whole bunch of agroecosystem services like human health. So if you have a healthy soil, you often have healthy, healthier people because you, might, you can produce a lot of food and you can produce it with minimal pathogens being transferred from the crops to people. Uh, it can improve food security, water quality, it can reduce climate change, increase biodiversity, and then also improve your farm economics because it can make certain um, the use of, if you're gonna use fertilizer, if you're gonna use pesticides, it'll be more effective. And then, so, so soil health is like this new hot thing. It seems like really obvious maybe to everybody in this room. <laughs> but, but for the longest time, soil scientists wore a lot of suspenders. There's a lot of suspenders. <laughs> and and a lot like this kind of, they think of soil as not as a living organism, right? And we're starting to realize that soil health is just like human health. If you go to the doctor, they're not going to like just take your blood and be like, oh, good lipid count, whatever. And sorry, you know way more about this than I do. <laughs> and they're going to be like, you're healthy, bye. But they're going to check that. They're going to check your heart rate. They're going to check your pulse. They might ask you about your mental health now, like all these things. And then we're like, this person is healthy or this person needs to, you know. And that's just what we do with soil. So we need to think about the soil as a living, holistic system. And so we look for metrics or indicators, just like you would take a blood count, you might you know, check your pulse, things like that. It's the same concept, but applied to soils and agriculture. So we have physical indicators of soil health, biological and chemical. I have so many slides that I'm not gonna show you, but if you want to, I'm happy to talk about this more, teach a whole class on this. So, um, so we wanna look at these different kind of indicators and that can help us triangulate how healthy the soil is and then what practices we might want to employ on those farms in order to try to help boost the health of that field. And the best way to do this is soil carbon. Soil carbon sits in the center of all that, all of those things. It can change the, the if you think about a healthy soil and an unhealthy soil, so you probably all hopefully held dirt, I really hope you have, um, held some soil in your hand at one hand, in one, you know, what time in your life, you scooped it up and it just like sifted through your fingers there's like nothing in there. You saw a lot of maybe like crystals or something looks kind of shiny, you know, on your hand. That's maybe indicative of, of a not so healthy soil because there's nothing living in it. And then you probably scooped your hand up in the forest, maybe hopefully, and you saw the roots and the fungus and everything. And it, you can just tell it smells, it holds water better. So that is a carbon. That's carbon doing its job in the soil and making it spongier and holding onto more water. And so, um, when we think about, when I think about, you know, what do we really want to focus on uh, and for soil health? It, carbon. Carbon does all this great stuff. And, fun sidebar, it also pulls all that carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and stores it in the soil, which is where we want it to be in the first place. So, what am I going to do here? <laughs> so, I'm going to be working with Claudia Rojas. This is the O'Higgins region, and she's got some really cool new projects going on. And they're trying to take baseline soil information across the O'Higgins region in different agricultural um, production systems. And they're going to be looking at soil health indicators. This is great. This is what I do. So um, I'm helping them sort of design which uh, indicators to look at. How are you going to measure those? How do you make it quick and easy so you're not on the same farm forever? How do we do this on a wider scale? Um, and then trying to think about how those soil health indicators might also then lead into like more sustainable agroecosystems, both for the environment, but also for people, right? So the other thing that you can't forget when you do this kind of work, and multiple people mention this, is the farmers know best, right? <laughs> so I think that's actually my next slide. Um, 
I think it's this one. Yeah, so thinking about these indicators, but farmers know best. They are the ones that know what the market problems are. They may have infrastructure issues like, yeah, I'd love to grow that, but I, there is no road from here to there, you know, and maybe not in Chile, but in other countries where I've worked. And so I would love to grow cauliflower, but like it, I have no way to get it to the market. <laughs> so they have a much better sense, farmers do, of what the issues are. And then also, uh, if you're a farmer, you know what soil health is. Like it's in your gut, <laughs> it's in your blood. And so working with farmers, like what do they think of when they think of a healthy soil? And then how can we use scientific, right, like empirical measurements to fit into that kind of framework? So working with farmers, and then this is something I'm really excited about, which is demonstration stations. Some we call these like, so many of you are from land grant uh, schools, so you probably, you probably have like a campus farm, or there's some sort of, right, some sort of extension. I heard, I heard Ellen say something about extension. So these are really cool. And um, Universidad de O'Higgins is starting a new one. And they just acquired this property. And now they're going to be building one of the first demonstration se um, stations in the region. And demonstration stations are awesome because they're a place where students can go to conduct their, their research. But also, they are a really good way to, to demonstrate, hence that, uh, to farmers that, this, that something could work. So it's, it's too big of an ask to go to a farmer and say, hey, would you just like totally change the way that you grow corn just so that I could do this experiment and then take a bunch of data? That's no. So what, what instead we try to do is if we come up with an idea and we think it's going to work, we test it out first. And then if it really works, we can, we bring farmers, this is what extension is all about, to that demonstration. And we say, this is, this works pretty well. These sensors can track water in the soil and then they talk to the cloud and then they can do watering on a schedule that's much more water efficient, for example, and it's cost effective. And then a farmer who wouldn't necessarily have experience with that could test it out, see how it works. So we, so demonstrations are great, and um, I'm gonna be helping them design that and also take a lot of the baseline data for that demonstration station. This one, I don't think was in my original proposal, <laughs> but that's okay. Um, so, uh, I was part of a grant that we just got funded, which is very exciting. So I um, found out about a couple weeks ago <laughs> that um, this project for saltwater intrusion in the Los Lagos region was funded um, by some of the um, scientific organizations here in Chile. And so we're going to be taking some of the um, different kinds of methods that I've used on the east coast of the US. And then we'll be looking at the Los Lagos region. And I'm really excited to be working with my partners. I have no idea what this entails. This is, actually, this is me. But um, I got here in January, so that's me taking some soil samples um, when I was here earlier, just uh, trying to get some baseline data. So I think, oh, oh no, I would be remiss. I'm a, I'm a nerd, right? So I have to show you a little bit of data. So to bring this all full circle, putting together the carbon and the saltwater intrusion, um, this is a question I think about a lot. So. How do we, it's like a fancy way of think, saying like, thinking about using our farms to do things besides just producing food. So what if we kind of like farmed carbon? Like we thought about ways to, to, to translate, you know, to sort of really change our agricultural system so they did other things like store carbon. And so this is one of my field sites in Maryland. And so I want you to just imagine this is like a healthy corn crop and you're walking from that healthy corn crop this way towards the marsh. Okay, that's just this drone image that we took. And the y-axis is soil carbon. And then this is how much carbon you would find in the soil if you walked across that transect and took soil samples. So a heck of a lot more carbon in some of these systems that are a little bit transitional, right? And so what if we thought about our agricultural systems a little bit differently in the, in the coastal zone? And we thought about ways that we could actually farm carbon, manage our agricultural systems slightly differently. This is not, I mean, you can see, this is not a huge amount of land. This is a couple, you know, 10 meters. But it can completely transform how much carbon you have in the soil. So I'm really excited to take some soil samples to work with my, all my collaborators here and, and see what the differences are between the, some of the coastal systems here and in the US. And happy to take any questions.